not very Christmassy, I know, but to make up for it, I'm going to do the whole lecture while wearing this Santa hat. <laughs> okay, this is something that's been, uh, it's kind of been bugging me for years, because I get asked this all the time. Um, every time I've lectured anywhere public, outside of Gnosis, this is one of the questions that comes up regularly. If you've had a phase A or B with me, it's probably come up in classes as well, and my response was probably something along the lines of, don't get me started. <laughs> but I've been asked enough times that now you've done it, you've got me started. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at uh, what this really means, because it's um, reaching uh, what I think it's like a serious problem right now in the spiritual community. As an example of that, there's the um, Spirituality Expo that's been running in London for the last few years. And this year, they changed their name from the Spirituality Exposition to the Inspirational Exposition. And the reason for doing this was to give people hope to face the changes that are coming in December 2012. And that's when I thought, okay, this is getting a little bit carried away. So I started looking into what actually is being said, where is this coming from, and uh, had some interesting discoveries along the way. So what we'll look at is what are the claims that are being made regarding December 21st, 2012? Well, the first claim that's being made is basically everything's over. And I mean a lot of people that think that. Okay? The other thing that you see, if that's too depressing for you, but it's, it's a little too depressing. The other claim is, well, it's not that everything's going to end. It's this really important change that's coming. It's some kind of tipping point. It's some significant date that will bring about a change to humanity. And if it's, the end of the world sounds too depressing, it's going to be some sort of uh, global consciousness shifting or something like that. The idea being that it's still a significant date of some sort. And let's have a look at what these claims are all about. The first thing we'll explore, and this is the important part, is where did this idea come from? Why the whole concept of December 21st, 2012? Now, you're probably familiar with this, but there was the Mayans, right? They had a calendar called the Long Count Calendar that supposedly ends on December 21st, 2012. Therefore, they must have known something, right? Because if the calendar is going to end, there must have been a reason for it. The idea being, that they have to have known something was going to happen, or they had to have made some predictions about what was going to happen in December 21st, 2012. Where did the idea come from? This is important, because every time you see a concept like this, every time you see uh, a theory or a claim, it's always really important that you apply a little bit of critical thinking and you ask, where did it come from? Where are the origins of this idea? When you think around about the 21st or December 21st, 2012 prophecy, this is where it came from. One guy. There was a guy called uh, Michael D. Coe, and he wrote a book called The Maya in 1966. Okay, and he talks a lot about the Mayan calendar and Mayanism in general, a lot about the culture, a lot about the religion, and he made a passing comment regarding the calendar. He's talking about the calendar, he's talking about the number system, and he talks about how it seems to end at a particular point. And he says something along the lines of, perhaps the Maya knew something significant to this date, perhaps they, perhaps they considered it some sort of an apocalypse. So he makes a side comment using his own words, perhaps, just kind of throwing an idea out there, and I don't even think he realized the implications of what he was doing. So in 1966, a single author throws out this idea that there might be something significant with the end of the Maya calendar. Then that idea picked up and was disseminated by all kinds of authors. Each author basically took his idea and ran with it. One of the most famous ones was probably a guy called Joseph Arkell, and one of the, or Jose Arkell, sorry. And one of the things that uh, he did is he claimed to be basically a reincarnated Mayan priest. Okay, and he's basically claimed that this Mayan priest still spoke through him, and he made a lot of predictions regarding 2012. So the first guy was Michael Cohen in 1966, then this guy, Jose Argel, came along, made all these crazy predictions because he claimed to be channeling some sort of a Mayan priest or a Mayan religious figure. But after that, there was a lot of authors that kind of got on board this idea, each adding their own twist. The unique thing that each author brought forth was basically how the world's going to end. So they all said, yeah, that's a good idea. End of my encounter means end of the world. 
but how is it going to end? So each author started talking about things like solar flares, galactic alignments, planetary alignments, collisions with rogue planets, that kind of stuff. Then fast forward a few decades and then it really takes off, especially over the last handful of years. The ideas regarding December 21st, 2012 have been picked up and disseminated all over the place. The internet is ridiculous for December 2012. <laughs> there are literally, if you do a search, there are hundreds and hundreds of web pages, forums, groups, discussions regarding 2012 where anybody is able to sound like an expert and share all their ideas and predictions. Then Hollywood got on board, which is always a bad sign, right? They released a movie called 2012 about the end of the world. One of the interesting things they did as part of a viral marketing campaign for this movie, they released on the internet a whole bunch of small documentaries with fake scientists as a way to promote this movie. Okay. Those things made it around the internet and people didn't know it was all a show for a Hollywood upcoming release. And that created a lot of panic and a lot of paranoia, which is exactly what Hollywood wanted, right? Because they wanted people to flock and see that movie. There was also another movie called Knowing with Nicolas Cage, which is a similar idea, that the end of the world happens as a result of some solar activity. Okay, so Hollywood gets on board and really spreads the idea, and that's when it really starts to take off. Then the History Channel starts running documentaries on the end of the world. The History Channel used to be, many years ago, a reliable source for documentaries, but the last few years it's really been watered down, and there's been a lot of documentaries that have run about the end of the world. Okay? Uh, New Age movements and cults have sprouted up all over the place, as you can usually expect when this kind of thing happens. There's a lot of New Age movements predicting the end of the world, a lot of cults predicting the end of the world, and many new age authors. I was at Chapters on Wednesday looking for a book for my dad, and when I go to Chapters I always swing by the new age section. The number of 2012s that I saw in that little section was unbelievable. At least like a third of the books were making references to Apocalypse, End of the World, Armageddon, My Encounter. That's all you see as you look down that list of books that Chapters has in their new age section. That's when I thought, okay, this is getting a little bit too ridiculous. You can kind of sum up all of that as mass media hype, right? And there's an expression that you have to think about. You might have heard this before. It's called follow the money. When people start making claims, you have to wonder why are they making the claims and the money that's being generated, where is it going? Basically right now, because of the, the climate that we're in regarding this, there are significant amounts of money being made for those that want to make talk about, start web pages, advertise, whatever, regarding 2012 claims and predictions. Okay, it's a really hot topic right now. There's a lot of people making significant amounts of money, especially the authors, especially Hollywood, especially TV shows. So let's have a look at where this comes from. Because the whole idea, remember, was this uh, concept that the Mayans had this calendar, this calendar was going to end, so they must have known something. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll have a look at this calendar itself to see what this calendar means. So let's have a look at the long count calendar. How many people recognize that? Everybody's seen that before, right? Yeah. Think. The only problem is it's not the long count calendar, is it? It's the Aztec Sun Yeah. Most of the books that I've seen or picked up regarding the long count calendar feature this. If you do a Google image search for long count calendar, you get pages and pages and pages of the Aztec Sun which is not the long count calendar. To confuse the Aztecs and the Maya, it's like to confuse the Greeks and the Romans. Different culture, different language, geographically, eh, kind of close to each other, but you can't do that with civilizations. You can't say, well, the Romans and the Greeks, eh, they're close, so let's call them one and the same thing. But the problem that's happening right now is people are confusing the Aztec and the Maya. And as we know, that is the sunstone. It's an Aztec thing. It's not the long count calendar. The Aztecs didn't even use the long count calendar. It's funny because if you showed people this and said, do you recognize this? Nobody would. Do you recognize that? Of course not. You've never seen that before. You know what that is? That's the long count calendar. Okay? That's, a, that's what it looks like. Um, the image on the left is more of a, a you know, zoom back view, and the image on the right is closer up. The interesting thing about the long count calendar is it's not a calendar. 
We think of the idea of like a calendar, like something we put on our wall, right? A physical monument that has these dates inscribed on it that suddenly stop. When you ask most people, what do you think about the long time calendar? They envision a calendar somewhere where all these dates are recorded and suddenly the dates stop. It's not a calendar. It's a system of recording dates. We have one too. We call it day, month, year. Okay? It's the same idea as our system of counting day, month, and year. Okay? The long count calendar isn't a calendar on a wall somewhere or carved on a stone monument or found in some temple that inexplicably ends. It's not the case. It's actually just a system of recording dates. That's all it is. It's not a physical calendar, which most people on the internet in these discussion groups seem to think it is. A calendar that has a physical end date. Uh, the Maya, it turns out, they were, they were date crazy. They had a lot of different calendars that they used to track all kinds of things. Two of the most common ones is they had that one, the Zolkin, and that was the sacred year of 260 days. That was one of the calendars they used. In addition, and running concurrently, was the Hob. And the Hob was a civil year, kind of like our year, of 365 days. These two calendars running together gave what we call the calendar round. So we have one date. We say, you know, December 15th. They would have two dates. Each day would have a day from the Zulkin calendar and a day from the Hob calendar. Because those two calendars aren't the same duration, it takes 52 years to run through both of those calendars. So each day was known with a unique combination of two dates. One from the Zulkin, one from the Hob. Okay, and that gave you a 52 year time period. And that's what most of the Mesoamerican groups, the Aztec, used something similar to that. They kept a 52 year calendar as well. But the Maya wanted to be able to express units of time greater than 52 years. And that's why they invented the long count calendar. The way you see people talking about it, they make out that the long count calendar is this crazy accurate calendar, more accurate than even our own calendar. Therefore, it must have been really special, and the people that made this calendar must have had this great knowledge. It's not even an accurate calendar, unfortunately, because it can't account for leap years. Okay? Any calendar that doesn't account for leap years has an error rate of one day every four years. Because we know that there's not exactly 365 days in a year, right? There's 365.26 days in a year. And that's why we have to put in the concept of a leap year. Because if you don't add the leap year, as time goes on, everything in a calendar would shift. You're shifting basically a day every four years, okay? Or 10 days every 40 years. Or 100 days every 400 years. So without accounting for a leap year, after a couple hundred years, December 25th would start falling in the middle of summer. Okay, so the long count calendar, it's not even that accurate. So it's been given all these properties, all these mystical properties that aren't even there. Okay, because any calendar that can't account for leap years is not going to be an accurate calendar. And that's what the long count calendar does. The interesting thing with the calendar is it counts up from year zero. Okay? The date of creation. Just kind of like our calendar counts up from year zero, the birth of Christ, right? If you are Jewish, this is not the year 2012, it's the year 6000 and something. Okay? It's just a subsection of our culture decided to reset the calendar at a particular point in time for a reason that was important to them. Okay? The Maya did something similar. At a certain point, they reset their calendar to zero, and they called that, that's the date of creation. That's the important point, okay? It's similar to how we reset our calendar to indicate the year Christ was born. Now, according to the Popol Vuh, which is a document that's quite regularly cited in defense of a lot of Maya predictions, the important thing to note about the Popol Vuh, if you're familiar with it, is there's no dates given anywhere in the Popol Vuh. Okay, so it doesn't have any dates, it's more of a story of their religion, their myth, that kind of thing. And according to this document, or this book, we're living in the fourth world. Okay, there were three previous failed creations before us, before the world of man started. We're the six, according to the Maya, we're the successful fourth creation. So there was three failed creations before us. When this creation started, they called it year zero. Okay, so that was the year zero for them. The, from the origin of the time of man, you could think of it that way. 
Okay, we call our zero when Christ was born, they called their zero when civilization became, when the world of man was formed. So consequently, according to the Maya, our world was created at the end of the last great cycle. The last great cycle for them is about 5,125 years. Okay, so about 5,125 years ago was year zero for them. That's when they said that the world as you see it now with humanity, that's when it was created. Okay, 5,125 years ago. Now, according to some interpretations of the calendar, December 21st, 2012 marks the end of that great cycle. Okay, so imagine that you fast forward a couple thousand years into the future and you're some sort of an archaeologist or somebody that's researching the history of humanity. And you discover that round about the year 3000 and something in the Jewish calendar, we suddenly set the year to zero. Because that's when Christ was supposedly born, right? We set that point to zero. What we're doing is looking at the Maya the same way. We're looking back on them and going, at some point they suddenly set the calendar to zero. That meant the time that had elapsed up to that had to be really, really important or significant. So that would be like us saying, okay, in, by the Hebrew calendar, around the year 3,800 and something, it was suddenly reset to zero and a new calendar was started. Therefore, after another 3,600 and something, there's going to be an important change that comes. Okay? But we know the change that occurred <coughs> was the birth of Christ, and that's why the calendar was adjusted. It wasn't apocalyptic, it wasn't the end of the world, it wasn't mass destruction. It was, for the people of that time, a culturally and uh, religious significant event that marked the resetting of the calendar. Something similar has happened with the Maya, and we'll see that. This is basically the units of the calendar. We have a day. After seven of those, we have a week. After approximately four of those, we have a month. After 12 of those, we have a year. After 10 of those, we have a decade. After 10 of those, we have a century. After 10 of those, we have a millennium, right? This is the same thing that the Maya do, except instead of a day, they have what's called a kin. That's their, that's their base element, okay? The sun rising, the sun setting is a kin. 20 kins make an uano. 18 uanos make a ton. 20 tons make a katoon. 20 katoons make a baktoon, and so on and so forth. And you can see from this calendar, basically the units of time that they have. That's the number of days on the one column, and that's basically the number of solar years on the far right column. Okay? You'll see an approximate in front of everything, because remember, they didn't account for the leap year. So they tried to round off the solar year into an even number of days, which we know isn't possible okay, without accounting for the leap year. So that's why everything is approximate. So you can see how they derive their units of measurement for their calendar. In very much the same way we do day, week, month, year, decade, century, millennium. It's the same kind of concept for them. Now to use their calendar, because remember it wasn't really a calendar, it was just a way of recording dates. Okay, just like we have a system that we can record any date and time by noting the day of the week, by noting the month, and by noting the year. That's how they used their calendar as well. But rather than writing everything out in letters, they had a symbol that represented each of the calendar units, okay? almost like hieroglyphics. So their dates were written as a hieroglyphic, written as a set of symbols. How you often see it referred to in modern times is we express each symbol with the number that it represents. So if we were to take a Mayan date, we would write it like this. So let's take November 25th, 1974, which is actually my birthday. I figured you've got to start somewhere, right? Uh, in the Mayan calendar, that's written as 12, 18, 1, 6, 14. Because that's what that date would look like to them. Okay? And this is counting up since year zero. So I was born exactly 12 back tunes, 18 cat tunes, 1 ton, 6 boonals, and 14 kins since creation. Okay? The symbols that you see here, that's the symbol for a back tune, that's a symbol for a cat tune. How they count the numbers, each of the bars is a unit of five, and the color dots represent one. So we have five, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, there's one. There's five plus one, six. There's five, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so that's all that the long count calendar is. It's just a system of recording dates, okay, where each date is described with a symbol, and then they show how much of that symbol there is. Now, the problem with the long count calendar, and this is where the paranoia comes from, 
is let's have a look at what December 20, so this is the day before the end of the world, right? December 20, 2012 will be written as 12, 19, 19, 17, 19. Basically that everything is one away from rolling over to the next units. Because everything is in base 20, with the exception of this column, which is base 18. So that would look something like this. Okay, so December 20, 2012 was 12 Bactoons, 19 Captoons, 19 Tons, 17 Uinals, and 19 Kins away from the date of creation. And as I mentioned, each one of these is full, because you can't put any more bars or any more dots on. So each one of those characters is basically full. Okay? So what happens in December 20, 2012, is it looks like this. 13, 0, 0, 0, 0. Which symbolically is written like that. The 13th Bactoon. Okay? No Bactoons, no Tons, no Uinos, and no Kins. Oh no, it's a round number. Okay? Um, there's something wrong with a, a civilization, humanity, society. I don't know what it is. We've got this thing about round numbers. Recently, went, we went through a similar event where a bunch of uh, high numbers became a bunch of round numbers. Remember that? 1999 going to 2000? Yeah, we're doing it again, but with a different calendar. <laughs> That's pretty much what's happening. Okay? This calendar is close to rolling over in the same way that we rolled over from 1999 and 2000. We're hardwired to prefer or have a preference for round numbers. So what happens is we want to think of round numbers as being significant. Okay? It's like counting seconds. What would happen when you got to 100 seconds? Nothing. What happens when you get to 1,000 seconds? Nothing. What happens when you get to 10,000 seconds? We just like to give uh, importance to a round number for some reason. Okay? It's kind of like hardwired in the way that we understand math and we understand numbers. So this is the problem that we're faced with. 20, December 21st, 2012 becomes a round number in the Mayan calendar. Okay? It becomes a bunch of zeros instead of a bunch of other numbers. And it kind of sounds silly, but that's what started this all. Going all the way back to 19, 1966 with Michael Cull saying, perhaps the Mayans ascribe some sort of apocalyptic scenario to this. He kind of said that as a passing, whatever, and then a bunch of people got a hold of that and started running with it. Here's what January 1st, 2012 will look like. Okay, 13, 0, 0, 0, and then 11. Okay, 13 back, back tunes, 0 cat tunes, 0 tons, 0 urinals, but 11 kins. Um, wasn't like the calendar supposed to end though, or something like that? That's the thing. The calendar doesn't end. Just like our Gregorian calendar doesn't end. It has the ability to record dates basically forever. Right? We would just keep adding on a year every year. Okay? So that's the neat thing about this, is people think the calendar stops. And looking at this, you can see, wait a second, they would just start adding stuff on the end again, because the calendar has the ability to do that. Okay? So the current calendar, the long count calendar, doesn't end. It has the ability to record dates for over 63 million years. They made units of measurement to go at least 63 million years into the future. If the Maya believed the world was going to end after 13 back tunes, why would they even bother inventing systems that could count higher than that? Seems a little redundant, right? It's like, oh, the world's going to end in 5,000 years, so why do we invent all these higher order count dates? Remember this chart? Look at what a 20 uh, kin chill tunes becomes an Alawa tune, and that's approximately 63,080,082 years. Okay, so if everything was supposed to end somewhere back here, like 13 of these, why did he even bother making the higher order numbers? Okay, so that's the first thing to mention regarding the 2012 claims is, and this is really important to understand, because people think that the calendar stops. It doesn't stop. It rolls over to a round number. Okay, so the end of the calendar isn't the end of the calendar. It's the end of one of their time periods. The end of one of their units. In the same way, 1999, that became the end of the 20th century, but 2000 became the beginning of the 21st century. This is the exact same thing but just with a different calendar and a different number system. 
Another point to mention, this is something that you don't see people talking about often either. If creation was going to end, so if the world ends at 13,0000, and we're assuming the Maya knew this, because they predicted this, right? So if the world's going to end at the 13th Bactoon, why do they have, why do we have transcriptions that exist, so dates recorded by the Maya, talking about the future, that reference time periods beyond 13,0000? So there's your comment there. It's like, wait, what? We have dates that they wrote that actually go beyond December 21st, 2012? Yeah. In Palenque, inscriptions made in the time of the ruler Pakal in the 7th century AD, so 600 and something, uh, they're talking about future events that are happening 4,100 years in the future. Okay, so in the year 600 and something AD, they carved inscriptions that make reference to events that will happen 4,100 years in the future. That tells us that at the very least, okay, it implies that the ancient Maya expected stuff to continue for 4,000 years into the future. That's 2,700 years after 2012. Okay, so this idea of everything ending in 2012, if they believed that the world was going to end in 2012, why are they making reference to dates that go more than 2,000 years after that date? And these are dates that they've recorded that we have and that we can see. They're inscribed all over the place. In Tikal, there is a higher order long count date, not with a coefficient of 13, but with a coefficient of 19, which once again is even farther into the future. So they're making predictions, they're talking about events, they're talking about the returns of rulers and all that kind of stuff, and they're making these claims thousands and thousands of years into the future. Okay? It's not like they don't make reference to anything beyond 13.000. They regularly make reference to events that go beyond that. The other key point to understand is all of that stuff all this idea of December 21st, 2012 coinciding with 13.000, all of that assumes that we know the creation of the long count calendar to the day. That we can take that year zero that the Maya had, that we can say the exact day that they created that. So 5,125 years ago, we can say on this particular day they made that calendar. Because that's what we're claiming. We're claiming their calendar coincides with a specific day on our Gregorian calendar, December 21st. In order to do that, we have to be able to align the two calendars precisely. We have to be able to synchronize their Gregorian calendar and the long count calendar to the day. That's what's known as the correlation constant. Okay? How you would correlate or align the Gregorian or our calendar with the Mayan long count calendar. The problem with the correlation constant is nobody knows what it's supposed to be. Okay? Several scholars, and there's a lot of people doing work on this, have proposed different correlation constants which put 13,0000 to fall anywhere from 15, or sorry, 1752 to 2532. That's how inaccurate of a science trying to overlap those two calendars is. And a matter of fact, the correlation that arrives at December 21st, 2012, really puts it at December 23rd, 2012. And everyone looked at that and went, um, they probably meant it to be the solstice. So shifted it to December 21st. Okay, because by the constant that gives us 2012, the correlation constant, what that actually puts it as is two days after the 21st, but we assume that they really meant the 21st, so we just shift it because it fits what we want to believe, not what actually happens. The problem being, the only data we have to go on is at the time of the Spanish conquest, there's a couple dates that are made in reference to the long count calendar that we can kind of line up with ours. So this conquest was 15 something or other, and around that time we think it was this date. And that's what we're using. The only other information we have is the Maya occasionally kept uh, track of like transits with planets, Venus crossing the sun, that kind of stuff. And we're trying to align their astronomical observations as well. But the problem with using astronomical observations is they occur on regular cycles. So we don't know which point in the cycle coincided with the observation that they made. Okay, so you have to understand that the lining the calendars is not an exact science, and there is no way to be 100% sure of what it should be. 
Okay, and Mayan scholars, people that have studied the culture, people that have studied the inscriptions, studied the language, studied the religion, uh, they're not in agreement. There is not one unified agreement above Mayan scholars about what the correlation, correlation constant should be, with an error of basically over 700 years. Okay, so the December 21st, 2012, that's basically something that we want to happen. It's not something that necessarily is going to happen, and it's nothing that anyone can definitively say, because you're talking about a 5,000 year cycle compared to our Gregorian calendar. An interesting fact about our Gregorian calendar, the calendar that we're used to, is there's a lot of argument that can be made to the fact that it isn't even 2011 right now. Because there's all kinds of evidence that points to the fact that our own calendar was manipulated in the Middle Ages by the church. So we don't even know if it is 2011, let alone trying to coincide that with a 5,000 year old calendar from a completely different culture. Okay, so 21st, 2012 doesn't even synchronize with the long count calendar. So what we should do at this point is say, well, obviously, you know, all this started with the Mayans. They had this calendar which runs out but doesn't run out. And they have this time period which, you know, must have been really important to them, the great cycle. So all this end of the world stuff, let's go right to them. Let's go right to their sources. Let's go right to the, the, the inscriptions that we have. Let's go right to the, the Popo Vu, the Dresden Codex, the information that we have from the Mayan themselves and let's see what it was they actually predicted, okay? Because the minds themselves are writing these dates. So what was it they predicted about 2012? They didn't have any predictions. There's nothing. You got nothing. Okay, the minds didn't predict anything whatsoever regarding the end of the world. They weren't an apocalyptic um, kind of religion, okay? Whereas Christianity is the very end of the world, apocalypse, rapture, we're all going to go, right? Um, the Maya weren't. Okay, they didn't have the concept of the end of the world. Contrary to popular understanding, the ancient Mesoamericans, and if you want to confuse them here, you can, so it doesn't matter. So you can see the Aztec and the Maya, they left no oral or written prophecy about what would happen in 2012. Nothing. There's nothing there. So if you want to go right to the source and go right to their books and their culture and their language and their inscriptions and their palaces and their temples, and you want to look for it, you're not going to find it because it doesn't exist. Okay? Consequently, apocalyptic predictions, but we made those. Okay? We created those. They're, they're things that we created in modern time. They're not based on ancient Mayan beliefs. They weren't a doomsday culture, the way Christianity kind of is. Okay? They just didn't think that way. They just didn't talk about that. They just didn't see an end of the world coming. It didn't exist for them. Okay? So consequently, they didn't write it down anywhere. Now, there is one reference, one, just many, one. There's one reference, there's one inscription that dates to 130000. And all of their written information, we have one time that date appeared. And this is what you see thrown around in books and the internet all the time. At a site called uh, Tor, Tor, what is that? Tort Uguero. Tortuguero. There you go, perfect, thank you. Uh, Monument 6. Okay, it says the 13th back to, which is 13000, it's going to end, and a god, we don't know whether it's a single god or a group of gods called Bolin Yokte, will descend. So you think about that, you're like, well, there it is. What do you mean they have no prophecies? It's right there. Something's coming. And it seems prophetic. It seems like, okay, they thought some sort of god will end, and what I can tell you now is Bolin Yokte was sometimes seen as the god of destruction. That seems pretty prophetic, doesn't it? But the problem is, that one line is like pulled out of a paragraph. So that one line is quoted out of context with the rest of the inscription. When you actually, you can see the whole monument and you can see how it's decoded, everything around it is about a dedication of a building back in the 17th century, or 7th century. They built a building and were dedicating all these things that were gonna happen in the building and over the life of the building. And that's where the reference to 13000 appears. It's not in reference to humanity, it's not in reference to civilization, it's in reference to a building that was being dedicated. It was basically like, you know how we built something and then it's an important thing, we'll stick a plaque on it, talking about why we built this place and what it's for. It's like they used to do that all the time. They would build a uh, building and it was a big religious ceremony for them to rise a building and once the building was finished, there would be a dedication ceremony and references made to all the good luck and things that will happen to this building and its occupants over time. 
That's what that monument is about. It's about a building that was being dedicated. It's not about humanity, civilization, and the world in general. Okay? If you pull it out of context, which you see all over the internet, it seems like it could be prophetic. But you put it back in its setting, and it doesn't make any reference to humanity, or to civilization, or to the world. It's talking about a building. There's this guy. He's a Mayan elder. He's still around. And he's tired of being bombarded with frantic questions about December 21st, 2012. Okay, so we're going right to the source, the Mayan, the Mayan elders that are still around, that are still studying the language and the culture. And this is what he had to say. I just came back from England last year, and man, they had me fed up with this stuff. <laughs> okay, so that's right from the source, the Mayan elders, this is what he's speaking about. The long count calendar, interestingly enough, is still being used by some cultures in the highlands of Guatemala. It's still being used. Okay, there are still some cultures that use it, and going to them, uh, they, they don't have any doomsday points. It's their calendar. They've been using it for thousands of years. And if you talk to the people, they don't have any doomsday plans. They're not, you know, getting worried about the end of the world next year. They're just using their calendar. Because it's we, the crazy people, that have decided that it means the end of the world. So let's have a look at what's supposed to happen. Because we kind of have a look at the whole concept of the calendar and how it works and what it means and the relevance of the dates and that kind of stuff. But we can go a step further now and let's have a look at the specific claims that are being made. Because this is the stuff that's flying all over the internet. So proponents of the 2012 doomsday scenario, they make all kinds of different, and this is the neat part, even contradicting claims about what's going to happen. This is kind of like your big four. The claims being made, number one, some sort of rogue planet, an asteroid or a comet is going to collide with or affect our planet in some way. It comes close enough that the gravitational field does something bad. The second claim is that there's going to be a unique planetary alignment which occurs, which causes some sort of havoc or problem from our planet. There's going to be some sort of alignment with the galaxy, the galactic center, or the black hole in the middle of the galaxy, or the dark rift. We'll talk about the dark rift later. That just sounds cool. That's my favorite one, the dark rift. We're going to be in the dark rift. Okay? And the fourth point is a solar maximum. A period of intense solar activity that causes solar storms or solar flares that kind of makes it really difficult to be on Earth at that time. And that's the one that the uh, Hollywood movie Knowing ran with. And that's also the basis for 2012, right? Solar activity. So let's have a look at these. Let's start with the concept of rogue planets and other objects. The claim is that there's some planet or some sort of an object. The object is either an asteroid, a comet, or the new one is a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is basically a star that doesn't have enough mass to undergo a nuclear reaction. So it's a star that gives no light. Okay? Jupiter is almost like a brown dwarf, but it's just not quite big enough. The neat thing about brown dwarfs is they don't give off any light. They're like a star that doesn't shine, the idea being you can't see it. Okay? So something is on a collision course with us, or it comes close enough to affect us. And this is where you see spin-offs from this, like, okay, the increase in the gravitational field causes a crust displacement or a polar shift or a weakening of the magnetosphere, which allows us to be exposed to all kinds of harmful radiation, blah, blah, blah. Um, and if you've been far enough in Gnosis, you'll see that there's some similarities to even what Master Samael talks about with the planet Herculobos. Okay, and at first glance, there is some overlap, because we've looked at some of what he talks about her Herculobus and the Tylo galaxy and all that kind of thing. The thing to keep in mind is the universe is huge. It's really big. So yes, there could very well be, at this moment in time, somewhere in the universe, an object that's on a collision course with our planet. Yes, this could happen. It's happened tons of times in the past. Our Earth is full of scars of previous collisions. And some of those collisions could have been extinction-level events. That's what we think did the dinosaurs in, right? We're finding evidence all over the planet of huge craters and debris fields that show, yes, there's been many times when our Earth has been struck by a large object. It probably is going to happen again. Realistically, realistically, looking across the six billion year history of our planet, we can see it's happened a bunch of times. So project far enough into the future, odds are, yes, the Earth is going to be hit by an object. It's probably going to happen. 
What we want to concern ourselves with is not if it's possible, because yes, it's possible. And somewhere in the galaxy, there could very well be a large planet or a large body of some sort that's on a collision course or on a trajectory that will bring it close enough to Earth to cause problems. So we're not asking if that is possible, because yes, it's possible. What we want to concern ourselves with is it going to happen in the near future, okay? Approximately a year from now. The funny thing with that, and it's a really simple counter, is if there was something big enough to cause problems for us, you'd see it. Okay, it would be close enough to, for a planet to be close enough to collide with us next year, it would have to be between Jupiter and Saturn right now. Jupiter and Saturn are the two brightest planets in the night sky. So for a planet or some large body to be coming to us in the next few years, you'd see it. You'd walk outside at night and you'd see it, it would be right there. Okay, it would be easily visible, and not just easily visible, it would be the brightest thing in the sky aside from the moon. Okay, obviously the moon is going to be very close to us, right? It's really bright. But looking at the rest of the planets, it would be the brightest object in the night sky and would have been that way for the last few years. Okay, so this is something to think about for a minute because we know where the planets are. We know where Saturn is. We know where Jupiter is. We know the velocity at which planets move given gravitational constants and all that kind of stuff. You can calculate this. It's not really that hard. And given how fast they travel, given the distance, of the known planets in our solar system, we can figure out where an object would need to be if it's going to hit us this time next year. Okay, then you can go stand outside in the night and look for it. The current telescope technology that we have, starting with just optical telescopes, but also infrared telescopes, radio telescopes, etc., etc., we can see quite far into the universe. Okay, we can see, we can't see to the end. Okay, but we can see pretty far. Uh, and as of yet, we haven't detected any unknown planets or large planetary bodies anywhere near us. Yes, we see, probably see in the news that they talk about, we've seen other stars that have planets and all that kind of stuff, but we're talking about significant distances here. Any object just outside the visible realms, because we can only see so far, the universe is incomprehensibly huge, and we can see about this far away. Okay, so this is where we are, we can see about to the end of my hand. But interestingly enough, anything that's be beyond the end of my hand, we're talking more than 100 years to even get close to us. So we can see about 100 years into the galaxy, given how far objects travel. Okay, so as far as large bodies that are causing us problems, that's a pretty conservative estimate, about a 100 year window that we have, which is nowhere near a year. So you could say, any object that's going to come near the Earth in one human lifetime would be visible already. Okay, so anything that's going to get us, I think of everybody in this room, your lifetime, if there's an object coming in your lifetime, it would be visible. Okay, it would be something that would be seen, tracked, observed, that kind of stuff. As regards asteroids and comets, because yes, there's a lot of those that are near the Earth. Okay, there's a lot of asteroids and comets that are referred to as having near-Earth orbits. We know where they're going, and they're spinning around and around, and yes, they come close to us. Those are easily and regularly tracked. If you want to, there's publicly accessible websites and databases with their locations and trajectories. So you can see where they are right now, and you can track their orbit into the future. Okay, we regularly track these things. And we got about a 20 year window on those. Okay, so we can safely say for about 20 years there's going to be nothing coming really close to the Earth. Okay, outside of that, there very well could be. In 22 years from now, there could be an asteroid or a comet on a collision course with this planet. Okay, but we've got about a 20 year window as far as we can see and track those orbits. Now, when you look on the internet, um, if I was to do this stuff or this presentation to a larger group of people, especially people that are really into the whole 2012 doomsday scenario, regarding the planets, they usually throw out a couple things. Uh, one of the things they say is, ah, but you can't see that planet because it's on an orbit where you can't see it somehow. Um, <laughs> there is no location in the sky that's not visible from somewhere on Earth. Okay? And there's no way an object could take an orbit or a path that would obscure it from view from everywhere. And then they say, ah, 
but it's behind the sun. <laughs> Forgetting, going back to grade, what, four or five, when you figured out or were told that the Earth goes around the sun. So this planet would literally be playing peekaboo by always moving the same way as us, trying to stay hidden. And it's funny, but there's people, that's whole web groups on the internet based on that concept. And they literally try to take pictures of it with their camera, and they take pictures of the sunset, trying to catch the planet that's hiding near the sun. So that's the claim, is yeah, the other planet's there, but you just can't see it from where you are, because it's hidden somehow. But I don't exactly know what they mean by how, because there's nowhere in the sky you can be that can't be seen from some point on the planet. Yes, we're in the northern hemisphere, we can't see the sky in the southern hemisphere, but there's people down there that can't, right? There's no point in the sky that can hide from view from every single point on Earth. And then a few years ago, they built a radio observatory in um, Antarctica. And people said, ah, see? Because it's down there. So they're using this radio, which isn't even optical, so it doesn't make any sense. They're using this telescope they built to track this planet that can only be seen from the exact point of the South Pole. So we're spinning around, but somehow this planet is following us underneath and not moving and staying exactly in sync and only visible from one point. But remember, our Earth is kind of curved. So even if you're like over here, you can still see down there, right? Our view of the sky isn't a single point, it's quite a wide circumference. And then you see the other, and there's a whole group of people um, that claim this. The object is invisible, somehow, by some property of physics that we just were too silly, that we, don't, we can't comprehend it. You know, our, our technology isn't there, but that object is invisible. It's obscured, I've seen obscured by a cloud of dust, its gravity is so intense, it bends light, creates a red light shift that hides it. It's uh, hiding in the uh, uh, dust trail of a comet, whatever. Basically saying, for some reason, the planet's invisible. Even if the planet was invisible, because we didn't understand how it's absorbing light, it, whatever. What we would see is its gravitational pull would affect the planets in our solar system. So if it was coming towards us, but was invisible for whatever reason, it would cause changes in the orbits of the planets. Because remember, the whole theory that this is supposed to be bad for us is the massive gravitational field is going to wreak havoc on our planet, right? Well, this massive gravitational field would alter the orbits of all the known planets. So we could go outside and say, well, Jupiter's supposed to be here, but, oh no, it's a little over there. Something has disturbed its orbit. So even if visibly the planet hid from you know, the visible light spectrum, hit from the infrared light spectrum, or whatever reason, you'd still see the results of its gravitational field. So it's impossible for a large body, something big enough to cause problems for us, to be there, be invisible, yet not disturb anything else with its gravitational field. So that's the, uh, that's the rogue planet theory. Let's look at the planetary alignment theory. The claim here is that the planets are going to align in some way which will cause something bad to happen on Earth. The idea being that the planets are going to arrange themselves in some specific order where there's some kind of magnified gravitational field that's going to cause some sort of pole shift or crust displacement or whatever. Planetary alignments, we call them conjunctions in astronomy. Uh, they're not rare. They happen all the time. Okay, So we're talking about alignments of the known planets in our solar system. Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Mercury, Neptune, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're easily visible and they're predictable because uh, we know where all the planets are supposed to go. The orbits of the inner planets have been known for long times, thousands of years. Okay, we know where they're supposed to be, therefore you can predict alignments, and this happens all the time. Funnily enough, there's actually none in 2012. So I don't know where that even comes from, this kind of planetary alignment, because there will be no planetary alignments outside of the ones that happen every year. Because there are some planetary alignments that happen on a yearly cycle, we're going to assume that they're pretty safe because they happen every year and they don't cause problems. But as far as unusual alignments, nothing. 2012 just doesn't have any. So there's the end of that theory. Galactic alignments. This is cool because we're getting into the dark rift. <laughs> According to this claim, on December 2012, uh, our planet aligns in some significant way with, and depending on the theory, the person talking, uh, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Recent scientific discovery, the center of our galaxy probably has a giant black hole in it. And we're going to align with it somehow, and we're going to get like sucked in, or the gravitational pull distorts the Earth, or something like that. Um, or the dark rift. That sounds cool. I want to start a band, and we're going to be called Dark Rift. Is that going to be in it? We're in Dark Rift. Uh, the galactic plane, basically the center of our galaxy. The basic idea here is there's some sort of unique alignment with a particular point of our galaxy 
that causes problems for our planet. That's basically what we're saying. Our planet's basically our whole solar system revolving around the sun. That as a unit is revolving around our galaxy. And at some specific point next year, there's some really unique alignment that's going to cause a lot of problems for us. Our galaxy is really big. It's absolutely massive. That's kind of what it looks like. You are there. This tiny little speck that you can barely see of dust, that is our sun. Okay, and we of course are significantly smaller than our sun, that's our galaxy, it's, it's massive, you can't even comprehend how big it is, because it's, it's huge. Okay, the problem with that is, given how immense the galaxy is, compared to how small we are, you can't have a precise alignment down in a single day. That'd be like trying to place like a human hair exactly halfway between here and, I don't know, China. There's a huge margin of error there because you're dealing with an infinitely small object and an incredibly massive object and trying to like align those two to a precise point. It's not going to happen, right? It turns out that because the galaxy is so big and we're so small, uh, we and our sun have been roughly in the same spot relative to the galaxy for many years. We haven't really gone anywhere. And I'm going to show you that. Uh, what we're looking at is, this is the sun right here. This green line is the ecliptic. It's the path that the sun takes. This uh, bluish purple line here is what they call the galactic center. This is basically the galaxy here. I'm going to get a plate. I'm going to show this with a plate. Yeah, plates, right? Okay. Let's see if I can You can kind of think of the galaxy is shaped like this. It's actually disc shaped. Okay, so we're looking at the galaxy edge on like this. Okay, and this very center line is the point where the two plates coincide. See this dark stuff in the middle here, this dark spot? Guess what that is? It's dark rift. <laughs> <laughs> and the dark rift was uh, of some significance to the Maya. Basically what's happening with the dark rift is we're looking edge on down our galaxy. We're looking down our galaxy this way, okay? And what happens when you look down it that way is the density of dust and gas obscures the light. So when you look right towards the dead center of the galaxy, and you're looking right down there, what you can't, you can't actually see the light because it's obscured by so much dust and stuff. So it forms this strip, this band, that splits the Milky Way in two. Now, unfortunately, because of light pollution in our day and age, you can barely see the Milky Way, unless you go somewhere really far up north or something like that. But at the time of the Maya, the Milky Way was prominent. It was almost as bright as the moon, believe it or not. And they could easily see this dark rift, this break between the top of the galaxy and the bottom of the galaxy. So the dark rift is literally the space between the two plates, okay? Because we can't see in there because it's so dense, okay? So for them, they thought that was significant. And we can see... Sunrise, December 21st, 2012, look at us. We're right in the middle of the galaxy. We're sitting right in the middle of the dark rift. I just like saying that. Okay, so that's where we're going to be. So, okay, yeah, there's the center of the galaxy. Is this purple line. Look at that. We're lined right up with it. We're sitting right in the middle of that, that dark rift. That could be significant, except for, sorry, we're 2009. So, 2012, 2009, 2006. 2003, it's pretty much in the same spot. <laughs> so, actually, that to me looks more to be in the middle than 2012 did. Oh, no. And you know what? Check that out. 1870, 1941, 2012, same spot. Okay? Because we don't, the galaxy is huge. You don't do like laps around it every few years. We're barely moving compared to the massive pole. Okay? And because of that, what we see is because of precession and all that kind of stuff, that we've been kind of sitting in the same spot for like over 100 years and are going to be sitting there for a lot longer. Okay, so there's no significant with any significance with any of the alignments, because we've been there before, and nothing happened bad in 1941 or 1870. Okay, so why would we expect any different when we're looking at the exact same alignment for 2012? Okay, so we just saw galactic alignments. They're not rare. They're not like once in a millennium kind of thing. They happen regularly all the time, and they don't affect our planet in any way. That brings us to solar activity. Okay, and look at what's going to happen with all the solar stuff. 
The claim is 2012 will be some sort of increased solar activity, a time of crazy solar storms, solar flares that threaten life on our planet. And yes, it, in times of intense solar activity, there are problems on our planet. Problems like communication satellites losing signals, long distance phone calls not happening, cell phone signals being disrupted, those kind of problems. And they happen all the time. What you need to know about solar activity, here's some facts. There are solar flares that happen all the time. They are regular events. The number of flares varies over time in an 11 year cycle. So yes, 2012 is going to be an increased time of solar activity, but it happens every 11 years. It's not once in a thousand year, once in a 5,000 year kind of thing. The sun follows an 11 year cycle of activity. Okay, so once every 11 years it gets really strong, and then it wanes off, and then it gets really strong, and then it wanes off. And the time period between those getting really intense activity and waning off is 11 years. And yes, the sun is due to reach a maximum, a solar max, sometime late 2011, 2012. So yes, it's right. There is going to be an increased time of solar max activity. And then this group came along, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and they said, oh, it's going to be a strong one. They said the one that's coming in 2011, 2012 could be 30 to 50 percent stronger than 2001. And people on the internet picked up and they'll see, look, these guys in the National Center for Atmospheric Research, scientists, say it's going to be huge, 50% bigger than the last one we had. That's the problem, the last one we had wasn't big. Okay, in the last little while, we've seen solar maxes a lot bigger than 2001. And we're talking about only half as big as the one that happened then. So, there's the facts for solar activity. Yes, there are solar flares and stuff that happens. Yes, 2011, 12 is going to be a big one. But by big one, we mean not really that big. And they happen <laughs> regularly every 11 years anyway. So there's that one. But it's all a cover up, right? And I must be like working for the man or something. <laughs> because the argument that people are proponents of the claims, one of the things that they always say, especially when you start talking science, I'm coming across as some sort of intellectual type, what they say is, it's a cover-up. NASA knows. The scientists know. The government know. They know this stuff. And what they're doing is they're silencing people. They're bribing scientists. They're covering up the evidence so the world doesn't get out and people panic. Because, I mean, if you told everyone the world's going to end next year, it would be like anarchy. It would be like lawless, right? So the idea being that, you know, they know, they're just like covering it up. They're trying to hide it from you. The problem with that argument is, we'll have a look at what happens with modern amateur astronomy. Interestingly enough, the claims made about the end of the world, they're all astronomical in nature. And the problem with saying there's a cover-up is government agencies like NASA and scientists on the government's payroll aren't the only people with access to astronomical data and observations. Because this is the big the cover-up theory, right? That's the one that everybody throws in your face, is it's all a cover-up. Okay, but you just don't have right information. The government's falsifying information. They're hiding stuff. Okay, they're preventing the word from getting out. Um, and one of the interesting arguments behind that is there's, um, you know Google Earth? You can zoom in and you can see Google Earth. You ever seen Google Sky? It's like a view of the night sky. You can zoom around and see the planets. It turns out that if you go to Google Sky, and if you look, this certain point in the sky, there's nothing there. The data is missing. Which means that's where the death planet is and the government is covering up the information. They're hiding it for you. Um, and there's actually a flaw in Google Sky that everyone kind of knows about that has obscured a part of the sky. And it's right near the constellation Orion and people are losing their mind and there's YouTube videos and all kinds of stuff talking about how Google Sky is being covered up, right? But what people don't realize is Google Sky is like not the only thing with pictures of the sky in it. There's tons of other pieces of astronomical software that came out that don't have that point obscured. And then Windows did their live sky view, you know the Windows ripoff of Google Sky? Well they use Google Sky's data, so if you go on the Windows thing, there's that blank spot again. See? It's Bill Gates. He knows he's covering the data. Uh, amateur astronomy is a, a popular hobby. There's millions of amateur astronomers around the world. A 
Okay, and modern astronomers have access to incredibly sophisticated and powerful computer-controlled telescopes. Here's some guys from, this is London, the London, Ast London Astronomical Society. If you want to go hang out at Fingal, just outside of London, you can go meet these guys. These guys are very serious about their astrology or astronomy instruments, as you can see. Like, this guy's got so many telescopes attached to other telescopes, I don't even know what he's doing with them. Okay? Um, so, amateur astronomy is like a big deal. Uh, like I said, you can go out to Fingal, these guys meet on the weekend, and they have what's called star parties which is where huge astronomy nerds go to all nerd out together about telescopes. Like, look at this guy. That's, that's a huge telescope. And speaking of astronomy nerds, there's this guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> he also has a big telescope. <laughs> so yeah, some of the stuff I'm talking about is observations I've made myself. So you can go to these points in the sky where there's the supposed dark spots and planets and stuff, and you can look at them, okay? And the telescope I have is, is quite powerful as well, and I, I can't find anything, okay? So the supposed blank spot near Orion, there's nothing there, so that's the Google sky theory. And the neat thing about that is the point of the image that's blacked out is near the constellation Orion, and the constellation Orion has the best thing to look at in the night sky. It has the Orion Nebula. So everybody in a telescope, with this telescope in the world looks at that same spot. And supposedly everybody has missed the death planet that's coming. Okay, so a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about, especially when it gets to astronomy, is I looked, I didn't find it. There is nothing there. Astronomy, curiously enough, is one of the only branches of science left where discoveries and advancements are regularly made by amateurs. There are so many people looking at the sky that it's regular guys that find, or girls, that find supernovas and they find new comets and they find new asteroids. All this stuff is being tracked by amateurs. And there's tons of websites where people record their observations. They'll say, hey, I just found this object, go check it out. They'll say, okay, that's asteroid so-and-so and people create databases where you can see where you are in the world, pick a date, pick a time, see what's in the sky, and go look at it. You can look at the asteroids, you can look at the comets, you can see the planets and the galaxies and the nebulas and all that kind of stuff. It's very easily tracked. So as far as the cover-up goes, um, is that even, how are you going to cover up or silence millions of people around the world that are making observations in their own backyards? Okay? Or have I already been bribed by the government? If I've been sent here by the man, do you hide it from me? Okay? Uh, the other thing that people don't realize is most major observatories around the world, they're private homes, not government. There's one at Western, right? That's owned by the University of Western. There's one outside of Long Point, just about an hour and a half from here. These aren't government owned, they're privately owned. So this idea that the government is the one that's able to control and manipulate all this data, it's impossible. They don't do this. They don't have access to this stuff. They don't have access to these millions of people around the world that are actually making all these observations and making these recordings. It's, just, it's not possible. So let's look at the facts that we saw. The Mayans gave no significance to the end of the Long Kong calendar. Okay? Uh, they have no apocalyptic predictions. They have nothing written down that all these horrible events are going to happen on the calendar. There just isn't any. The ones that you hear are fabrications. They're made up. Don't forget it was all started by one guy in 1966 in a book. Okay? Uh, December 2012, it, it doesn't end. It doesn't end anyway. Okay? The calendar doesn't end. It has the ability to record dates for millions of years, just like our own calendar. What we do see happening is a number with a lot of nines becoming a number with a lot of zeros. Just how 1999 rolled over into 2000. Even trying to correlate 13000 with December 2012, it's just a theory. It's one of many theories, and there is no 100% definitive way to prove this. All you can do is suggest a theory that's different from somebody else's. Because we're talking about 5,000 years with very little information, very little data. There's no real way to correlate those two calendars definitively, and consequently, there's many different theories that exist that push that calendar anywhere from the 1700s to 2500 and something. Any planet or object that's close enough to collide with us or affect our planet in the next few years would be easily visible. You can't hide something like that. It would be in the sky, you'd walk outside and see it. 
And there's a good argument that suggests if it was going to be here for this time next year, you'd see it in broad daylight. It would literally be hanging out there. There would be no way to hide that. Okay, so it would have been the brightest object in the night sky for the last few years. There's no significance with any alignments with the galactic center or the dark rift. It happens all the time. The galaxy's huge. We're very small. We've kind of been in the same spot for a while. We'll continue to be in the same spot for a while. Okay, there's no significance there. It happens all the time. Uh, alignments with planets in our solar system happen regularly with no negative effects. And we saw that there just aren't any coming up for 2012. And solar maximums, yes, there will be one, but so what? They occur every 11 years. Okay, so the last thought I want to leave you with is that one. Spreading the facts, not the fear. Because in Gnosis, we know all about fear, right? And the ego that's associated with that, and how easy that overtakes the majority of society. And that's what's happening, right? People are doing very silly things. People are making poor financial decisions. People are making poor decisions with their jobs, with their children's education, because they think the world is going to end next year. Remember the May 21st guy? Remember the world was already going to end once this year? Remember Christian Radio? And they started all those billboards and said the world was going to end in May 21st, uh, 2011. People sold houses, cashed stock, quit their jobs, built bunkers in their backyards, pulled their children out of school, thousands of them, expecting the world to end. And it didn't. So he changed his prediction, remember that, to October 12th, 2011. The same guy said, oh, I made a mistake. I forgot to carry the one. It's October. <laughs> and then October came and went, and it seems to be a fixture in our culture. People make apocalyptic predictions. And in one sense, you could say, well, what's the harm? So people are free to believe what they want to believe. But unfortunately, a lot of people do very strange things because of this. They live and fear. And if we know anything about fear and the ego, we know how powerful an emotion that is. And there's no reason to live in fear. And then some people, it's not just living in fear, they act out of fear. And they make decisions with their life out of fear. Okay? So that's why you have to start looking at the facts of things and not giving into the fear. Okay? And there's too many people that will believe something because it's sent to them in an email, because it appears on the website. And we know that happens because of the ego. The ego gets a hold of that concept, and that fear grows and grows and grows until it basically starts consuming their thoughts and their actions and that kind of stuff. And yes, there are unfortunately people in, you know, in, the, in this day and age, there are people in this country, on this planet right now, that think the end of the world is coming in a year. Okay? And they're, they're hiding and they're giving up their life and they're quitting their job and they're losing all their money because they believe this stuff. Okay? So we kind of think, try to spread the facts a little bit and not the fear. So hopefully less people won't find themselves under the influence of that ego and won't be living their life accordingly. Thank you very much.